Some good ones. Some interesting ones. Wow, I'm surprised I can talk this morning after all that last night. Uh, while everybody's getting in place, there's a few things I can answer up front to help kind of move things along. We got a lot of good questions. Got a couple of interesting ones. I haven't decided if, there's, if you were serious or if somebody on the staff put in one in. Somebody asked if Jesse Rogers was married or single. They're looking for a partner for their ministry. I don't know if that was serious, but... Uh, a couple people ask where Benny and Hazel are. You know, the bass player, Benny, has been with us from the beginning. Benny and Hazel have have taken some time off and they're really in a time of transition. They didn't fall into sin and uh, it's not one of those kind of things. They didn't have a big fight with us or anything like that. They're just, you know, they have eight children and another one on the way and they pretty much lived at the church and, and they've really just, I think they're going through some changes in their life and they just need some change. And so that's kind of what's going on. I miss them just like you do. <laughs> I had three or four questions on that one, so. Uh, someone asked the question several times. Can I sit down? Is that okay? Yeah. Several times we've heard uh, the saying, our church was ruined before revival hit. Uh, that was, you misunderstood. It was ruined after revival hit. And uh, they're asking, the question is, what exactly do you mean by ruined? What happened? Was there conflict in the church, purification? Uh, this church, how old, somebody tell me how old is it? Y'all need some microphones. How old is this church? Is it? 39. It was founded, so it's 61, 62. This church is 62 years old. And uh, I really think that that probably Lori or Becky, Lori, how long have you been here at this church? Um, 12 years. 12 years. Seven. Seven. Carol? You went to church here as a child. Grab that microphone. Can, are we on back there? Orange is, is the color. What, give, give it, rather than me talking all the time, what do you think, give an idea of the difference you've seen in the church before and after revival? Um, well, it's just, to, it's, it's a different church today than it was before revival. <laughs> just even six years ago, much less when I was a child. Um, God moved mightily, even when I was little. I remember what's now the offices. You went to church over there. That was the church. And I remember as a small child, like these children on the platform last night, coming to the altar on a Sunday night and, um, crying and praying and looking up and uh, seeing Jan Hammock on the organ. <laughs> she looked like God up there on the organ, which was Brother Arnold's daughter. He was the pastor of the church the at the time. Jan works, works with me at MMI a lot and helps me out at the table. She's the blonde lady out there at the table. Her father, how long ago was pastor here? That was probably 30 years ago. Yeah. She's still around. She played the organ in the beginning of a revival, and I fought with her a lot. She wanted to quit. I'm sorry to mean to interrupt. No, that's, but even as a young child in Brownsville, 
God was moving and I guess preparing us for for revival. I think when we say you could y'all pipe in any time, but I think musicians, Lila, you're sitting over there too comfortable, honey. You look like you haven't had you look you look too comfortable. Come out here and be uncomfortable with the rest of us. Um, I think that when we say the word ruined, what we mean is when, when revival came to us, it made us read something we had never read before. We started reading the old revival stories and the revivalist at the turn of the century and, and the Welsh revival and just different things. Uh, it made us start reading a lot of Smith Wigglesworth stuff, which I had read on and off through my childhood and I'd read about Finney and different people, but I, people I had never read about was like George Whitfield. I'd never read George Whitfield. I'd never read a lot of those guys. And so I started reading those and I didn't have a lot of information about, um, even about Azusa Street. I knew that Azusa Street had happened and I knew that we, we talked about it a lot. Oh, they can't see me in the back. Do I have to, it's the God chair though. I don't like sitting. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll tell you what. I can't, don't do that. Just let my wife sit in that one. She's the only one that deserves a soft seat. Oh, Lila, you can sit. That's right. Lila's old. The old and the expectant can sit comfortably, and the rest of us, I'm kidding. <laughs> Amber, come sit comfortable, honey. You are comfortable? Now, can everybody see? We started reading about, about revival. You want to sit? <laughs> Come on, you sit there. Hey, there's no point in pride keeping somebody from sitting there. Somebody be comfortable. Y'all drove, where's Alvin? Alvin, come out here and sit on the stool. You can't sit in God's chair. <laughs> Uh, you know what I call that? That's first class and this is economy. <laughs> yeah, coach. Um, she's got enough flight miles. She has first class. So like, but when we started reading the revivals of time past, it was amazing to us. The Cambridge revival, which really had a great deal of, in birthing the Presbyterian movement. And it was a, a lot of Presbyterians involved in the Cambridge revival. And a lot of holiness movements were, were brought, bought out of that. If you've never taken the time to read some of that, it would be awesome for you to read it. Especially if you find yourself being from a Methodist background. Because the Methodists were absolutely nuts. Absolutely nuts. What, what is called... Methodism now is not even close. Uh, you have to keep in mind that John and Charles were banned from churches. They were banned from preaching in churches because they were too radical. And in their meetings, people would jerk in the floor. The women had those big buns from the you know, turn of the century. They had late, late 18, 1900s. They had 19th century. They had those big and they would jerk and their hair would all fall down and they would, they would, they said it would whip like, like go through the wind like a whip while they jerked in the presence of the Lord. That was Methodists. Also in Nashville, Tennessee, where the headquarters is there, uh, I used to live there and, and there's a, there's a big, uh, circuit riding preacher that for a while they had him painted on the side of their building, big mural of, of a circuit riding preacher. And it was amazing to me that I, I realized that probably most of the people working that building, very few of them understood what that really was because they're far from that now. So it made us read stuff and we suddenly realized that the mode and method of church in America that most of us grew up with was not where the church began. It was, was not even close to where the church had began. Now, was there constant pandemonium and no order in those revivals? No. I, I, from what I've read, no. There were many services uh, where uh, Andrew Murray McShane would walk in and they would just sit 
for three or four hours in silence. They were so careful about, I was reading about him just a few weeks ago, they were so afraid that they would fracture the spirit. And Andrew, uh, that's not his right name, Andrew Murray, yes. Andrew Murray McShane would not, I, I don't know if you ever read this, but he wouldn't even announce he was going to preach a revival somewhere. He would just show up the day of the revival. He, because he didn't want people to come. He wanted them to come because the Spirit drew them. He would have, listen to this, for all you singers, he would have some of the top operatic singers in the nation and in the, during the times, the popular singers that would accompany him in his services. But sometimes he wouldn't even let them sing because... He didn't want it to be a performance. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? They would literally walk in and he would sit on the front pew and just wait. Sometimes someone in the back would, would burst out into a hymn and everybody would sing a hymn. They'd sing a hymn for four hours. One hymn. Sometimes God would break out. People would be in the floor. They'd be all over the lawn. Sometimes they'd just sit there for three or four hours, dismiss and go home. And... Uh, so when we started reading that kind of thing, we started seeing how abnormal American church is. Bless you. We started seeing how abnormal the thought of coming in, having a little sermon, two or three hymns, a poem, a scripture reading or two, no invitation, go home, have chicken. Oh, the offering. We always have to have the offering. But we saw that that was not, that wasn't really what church was about in the beginning when God was moving. That was what man did. Uh, in, in my book, uh, the, uh, Touch of Glory, I, I cite five M's that, that happens to church and movements. And I've seen it, and you can almost put it into any situation. You can put it, you can even put it in a Brownsville situation. You can put it in pretty much any movement that's ever happened. And they always apply. There's always a man that God touches that gets set on fire. And God touches him in a powerful way. I wish he would just do it sovereignly, but he usually uses somebody. It started with Moses and it's never stopped. There's always been somebody who would step out and say, let's do this. And people followed. And there was a message that that man usually brought. And the people received the message. And things start happening. And suddenly when that man brings the message and the glory of God comes, the harvest starts coming in. And, and things start snowballing and nobody knows what to do with them. They're like running, trying to keep up. Like we were in the beginning here. People lined up all the way around the building, all the way to the street, all the way out to W Street. Four o'clock in the morning, the lines would start. And it wasn't because of Steve Hill, but Steve Hill was like, he walked into, in my opinion, a room full of gasoline. It was already full of fuel. The prayer in this church, like Carol said, had fuel all over it. And when Steve Hill walked in here that Father's Day morning, he had been to Holy Trinity Brompton in England and got the fire. And he walked in here and he said, it's time to burn. And he struck a match and it just went whoo. And we watched it. We just were amazed. So we were at the man and the message at that point. The third league, the third M we move into is method. Because suddenly we start trying to figure out what to do with all these people. So we start developing prayer teams. We start trying to figure out how we're going to do this. We, intercessory prayer teams start forming. Worship teams start trying to figure out what they're going to do. We start trying to figure out a method, which is all right. As long as you're at the figuring out the method, you're fine. The fourth M is the dangerous one, and it's one that we teeter on regularly here. And we all hate it. And we... we in some ways we've moved, just to be blatantly honest, in some ways we've moved into it. And we're presently seeing God jerk us out of it and kind of retool the whole thing. But you get a machine going. You get a revival machine going. Where it's like, 
Okay, the ushers know what they're supposed to do. Bill Bush, he's awesome right over there. That's our head usher. But the head, you know, the ushers know when to let the people in and know the little announcement to make. And we've got the disclaimers outside the door. So if the video, I mean, we've got, you get a machine going. It's just like, and, and the worship team and, and musicians will tell you that there's times that we've come in here and it felt like a machine. It was like suddenly, well, we're doing this, but why are we doing this? You know, we know we love the Lord and we worship the Lord, but why are we still doing this? And then there's other nights when the glory comes and it's evident why we're doing it. But the machine is a, da a dangerous place because the, le the next stop and the final M is memorial. Because usually after the machine has set in, it's relentless. And what we do is we do what the Methodists have done I'm not just picking on the Methodists. I'm just saying they're a good example because it's a wonderful church. I'm not slinging at them. The Lord's going to refire them. I believe that. I believe that. It's a good example because we're all so familiar with who founded it. Uh, we memorialize John and Charles Wesley. And we, we, we build shrines to them And back in the day. And, and I think if Brownsville is not careful... We, we run a real close danger of, of memorializing a season of God's movement. And that's not the will of God. The Lord wants to keep us in method. He wants to keep us trying to figure out how to accommodate what he's doing. And so that, that answered that question kind of long. But I, all right, I'm going to move on. These get real fun. How do you keep your choir from feeling... How do you keep your choir feeling included when you do all the worship with no choir specials. It's because I have a tremendous ego and I love the sound of my voice and I don't think anybody can quite sing it like I can. <laughs> yeah, there it is, Carol. I, you know, <laughs> the, whole, the whole world revolves around me. Um, you know what, in honesty, uh, our choir is just, our choir worship team, are, 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 they are just, I think, gold and cream of the earth because I don't really, they know my heart to know that I really don't desire to sing everything. But I am a, I am a flow person, completely a flow person. And I won't disrupt the flow. And sometimes, that's the reason our choir, when they sing specials, they have a, there's a seamless thing. Whereas when I was at Christ Church, the thing we did there, which worked there really well, was we had praise and worship. And then before the sermon, we'd have three, three choir songs, two or three choir songs. And that worked really well for that style of, of ministry there. Here, it feels odd. I've, I've always not wanted here to break the flow of things. So we're likely in the middle of praise and worship to do a choir song. And quite frankly, I, I, I confess this to you. I'll confess this to everybody here. You all know the truth. I, we've all been so overwhelmed, and I think I'm still overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed with the fact that God, through, through me, is, you know, especially me, because of, of, of the leadership role I have, he stuck me out on a platform that is overwhelming. I'm a father. And I'm still trying to be, I feel like I'm not a good word, I'm not a good music minister for this church because of the platform. Do you know what I'm saying? It's my own feelings album. It's like, if I were just being the music guy, it would be a, an easy, I know how to do that. But the thing that I'm reckoning, reckoning with is this, you know, when, when you get a call and they, and they say, we want you to come and minister and we'll have... 20,000 people there, you think, well, man, what if we could get a hold, what could we, if we could get that fire in those people, you know, what do you do? Do you just go, well, no, I'm not going to do that. So with that has come the opportunity to write books, and which has always been something I wanted to do from since, since being a boy, and I feel like it's a calling on my life. So reckoning those two is really hard. So we are just now exploring who all can really sing a solo. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, I see the mic, and I see, I see Lauren. Y'all go for it. Um, we are the choir, the musicians, the singers. We are a team. We're 
not separate. We're one team. Blendel is our leader. We're here for a job and a purpose and a mission. We don't come here to sing to you. We come here to serve God. And we follow Lindell because we honor him, we respect him, and we know that God has chosen him. And we all feel that way. We come in here with one heart and we worship and we do what God has sent us here to do. Well, and I think our choir. You say something, Becky. I think our choir is very unique. They have gone past the whole thing of doing a, you know, your Sunday choir numbers. You know, like someone says, it, it incorporates into the worship. We have a choir of worshipers. And if they never sing another choir tune, they don't care. They are up there expressing the worship that is in their heart. They are worship leaders as well. And they, their purpose is to draw in and you know, along behind Lindell, they realize that their purpose is to, to march with him just like they're on that front battle line, you know, of, of worshipers and, and going into to war and, you know, and so it's unique in that respect that they, they, you know, feel that they are worshipers and, you know, following in behind their leader. And it's not about doing a choir tune. Yes, we rehearse and yes, we do, you know, rehearse choir numbers and, and have them ready so that, and there's many times we'll plan to do a choir number or two, you know, and, and maybe, you know, warn the soloist. Well, then they never get to it. And then the soloist doesn't get offended that, well, we didn't do my song today. It's not about that. You know, you just go with the flow, whatever God wants to do that day. You know, we're spending a little time on this, but I think it's probably irrelevant to a lot of people. Uh, we, we, the thing that, that I'm probably more worried about the choir and not singing than anybody else. I, and, and I'm probably, I've never confessed this, but I miss the choir songs. You know, like we'll come in here and we'll go, we're going to do these three choir songs. And I think, well, I want to do those because, you know, can I let you in on a little secret? You know all this heavy progressive music that we do? I like some of it and I don't like all of it. I grew up in church and it's not a tradition or a religion with me. I just like the whole gamut of music. And I miss the more choral pieces. I miss them. But sure as the world sometimes we'll plan on doing something that way. And we're in the middle of transition. In case you haven't noticed at Brownsville, we are transitioning right now. And there are some things I'm going to go back and pick up, not religious things, but we've brought Miss Judy on to help us. And we're trying to work out a rehearsal schedule. We've never really had a consistent one. The, the worship team, the band, we've never had one because we were all such in revival mode that we couldn't do that. But it's important. It is very important. These people are worshipers. They don't care. And uh, I'm amazed that they don't care because I probably would. I mean, I, I probably would. So, okay, did we answer that one maybe? All right, moving on. I'm doing the worst ones, the intercession ones are coming. Do you put restrictions on your worship? Example, slow songs, three slow songs, five upbeats. Or do you let the Holy Spirit lead wherever he wants? Well, I think you know that. Like I said, I'll come in here with a big choir number on Sunday morning and Pastor will want to do one of those real. He scares me sometimes. Because <laughs> I'll, you all know, I, I kind of, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll wax sentimental and I'll pull out the hymn book and I'll do a, a string of old songs. Because I'm thinking Sunday morning, you know, some of our older folks are here, they might like to hear some hymns. He'll come up and just pick the rockinest thing we've got. Say, man, can we do that? So... Um, when you lead a multicultural congregation in the presence of God, do you purposely pick out different styles of music? Do you feel that your Church of God in Christ background influences your versatility? Probably so. Probably so. Like last night, all that, whatever that was after that fire, that was straight out of my bones. I don't know. It probably does, but I don't. I tell you something I don't do. 
I don't come in and go, I do and I don't. Because first of all, I'm not interested in entertaining the people, but I do realize that for those entrance songs, those outer court songs, that's the place where I'll probably lose the audience or pull them in. And I'm not in the spirit yet, but I'm heading them somewhere. And I can look around at a crowd and pretty well size up what they are. And sometimes with those entrance songs, I will sometimes realize if there's a particular core there, I'll go a certain direction just to try to bring them in. And then if, if I don't bring them in, then I can't help it, you know. It, like if I were to go, if I were to be invited, which I've been, but if I go to a more conservative church, I'll open up and do some hymns or something just to get a hook in their jaw. And then I'll take them on in. Because it's, it's important not to scratch their itch, but to, it's identification. I've said this before, but my grandmother uh, loved everything that ha happened, but she didn't love all the music. So I always think about grandma sitting on the third row, and I always try to incorporate something. I don't do it every service. This conference, we haven't done it particularly. But a lot of times in day-to-day -day worship, I will do it because I want her to be, I want grandma to worship too. And even if I change the melody, I change the beat, and I add a guitar to it. If the lyrics are familiar to her, she can latch on. You know, I won't necessarily do it the way grandma grew up on it, but I'll do it different. I'm trying to move on. Uh, do we have a representation from Dace? Are you here? Uh, get ready because I got some questions for you. Uh, worship team question. What do you do to help the worship team and band with such a big commitment so that they don't overload? <laughs> I'll let y'all do that one. <laughs> the first two or three years of revival we thought that we were the only ones that could be here and so we were here every night just about it but um, when we realized this thing was going to go on for a while we finally started you know saying okay well you come this night and it, or and I'll come this night and you know because we still have kids that are in school and play baseball and you know this week my son's been finishing up baseball and and uh, so, you know, you learn to, to balance and you learn to prioritize and to figure out what, what is best for your family and what you need to do. And, you know, you just, you have to ask for grace and wisdom to know, you know, okay, uh, we, need some, we need some good family time tonight. You know, we're going to stay home, we're going to go out to dinner or whatever, you know. You have to find out what is right for you, not based on what somebody else does. Well, we have, like, Mary, who was here last night. Uh, she's a nurse. Now, she's on a 4 o'clock morning shift, and she's really sacrificed to be here this week. Uh, but Mary, in times past, has taken a few months off. And occasionally, that's important to take just some time off, and, and we just fill somebody else in from the choir to try to, because we have a reserve back here, and we just kind of pull in someone just to make sure we don't blow everybody away. But these guys, now, here's the sick part. This is the sick part. I tried thinking, you know, bless their hearts. No, I didn't mean it that way. I can't even say it now. I'm snared by the words of my mouth. I think, you know, these guys, so I try to put them on a rotation. I say, you know, you sing, you sing Thursday and Sunday, and you sing Wednesday and Friday. They won't have it. So... What I do is I just say, just make sure I got three parts. I don't care who shows up. Just give me three parts. I don't care. So they kind of all fight among themselves. <laughs> they go, they got, a, they got a call list. I can't come tonight. Can you cover for me? So it takes a lot of that off of us at the and office. We were all afraid to miss because we were afraid we are going to miss something. Yeah. I'm yeah. telling you, you feel that anticipation in your spirit. And you, you know and God's still. moving, and you're not going to miss it. <laughs> when you know he's moving, you're going to be there. Yeah. And, the, and then something would happen, and one of us that was there would call the other one and say, Oh, you should have been there last night. <laughs> so then you get a complex. Well, it happened because I wasn't there, you know. <laughs> okay. Another question. What type of commitment do you expect from the band, choir, praise team, especially 
with as many services as you have. Again, when, when I say we're in transition, let me tell you what we have right now or what we're coming into in the fall. We have a Wednesday night service. We have a Thursday night prayer meeting now where there'll be worship at the end of it. We have a Friday night service and we have Sunday morning service. And thank you, Jesus, we don't have multiple Sunday mornings. And thank you, Pastor, we don't have Sunday night. Uh, it is difficult. We're, 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 again, we're, we're just now, Mike could even speak up on this. We're in the process of trying to figure out what to do because we can't draw from the same pool constantly because Mike is leading on Wednesday nights. I'm leading on Friday nights. And Mike and I kind of trade out. Sometimes he leads on Friday nights. Sometimes I lead on Friday nights. And more and more lately that's happening. And he does some Sundays. But see, when Steve Hill was here, bless his heart, uh, <laughs> Steve didn't think church could happen unless I was behind the keyboard. Again, it was what I was telling you about pastor. And the, it wasn't really that I led worship any better than the other guys. It was just there was a comfort level. The three of us are here, and he would be like a cat on a hot tin roof if I wasn't here. You know, like, he, he'd interrupt Mike. If Mike were leading worship, he'd walk out and interrupt him because he was afraid Mike wasn't doing the right thing. It was a comfort level. But we're still working that out. But our, our, choir, our requirements and our requirements, like, I'll, I'll just be kind of blatant with this and, and straight ahead. We did something during this conference that we've probably never done. Uh, I don't know if Lindsay's here, but Lindsay uh, sang with Mike on some songs because she sings with him on Wednesday night. Well, I kind of dropped the ball because we have a standing rule that if you're going to sing on the praise team, you got to be in the choir. Well, Lindsay's not in the choir, so when she comes back for school in the fall, we'll stick her in the choir because <laughs> she's got she's to do that. That's the protocol because we don't pull anybody. Now, these people who have been in revival for so long, so long and just like, uh, what's your name? <laughs> Rachel, <laughs> she's new. Since, since uh, Hazel's taken her little sabbatical, and, and, and so Rachel's kind of stepped in to, to fill in. And Rachel is Charlie's sister who plays the guitar. It's a family thing. Uh, she started, in the, both of them started in the children's church. Matter of fact, Pastor Kilpatrick told me that he dedicated both of them to the Lord when they were babies. Isn't that awesome? That kind of works when you stay around long enough. I think that's true. I thought it was. He told me it was. I didn't want to make a liar out of him. Uh, but we, we, we uh, ask that, that uh, our choir, Brenda can help me, but well, she's not here. We ask that our choir go through some kind of a discipleship class. We have cleansing stream at this church. It's a basic fundamentals of the faith that we put everybody through. Uh, we ask that they be members of the church or on their way to membership. We ask that, and of course, they got to be tithers. We don't want any thieves in the choir. Uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit is optional, but, but we pray that they'll be full of the Spirit of God. Uh, you know, and we, we have to deal with stuff just like everybody else does. You know, we'll get a word that someone, we have a wonderful system here. We have, uh, excuse me, we have pastors. We have uh, cell pastors that kind of, juris, kind of reside over different sections of the church. When we're bringing choir members in, we'll audition them, we'll take a picture of them, and we do a little file paper, piece of paper on them, and we pass them around to the cell pastors. Have you had any problems here? Are all these people okay? Is there anything you know that you're dealing with? It's confidential. It's not like we, we serve up people's problems to the whole church to let them know it. But, but you know, sometimes if someone's been in counseling or there's a problem, uh, a cell pastor will call me personally and just say, uh, so and so I've had, a, I'm in counseling with them and it would probably be a good idea right now for them to wait a little while about getting in the choir. It's as simple as that. And it's a wonderful way of, of making sure that as much as we can, the people on the stage are healthy and they're, you know, and we all have problems. Different ones in our worship team deal, deal with different challenges, our band. I mean, we, we're, we're all human beings and we all have trouble and sometimes we have need to step down i think one of the hardest things i think for musicians and singers and choir members is to, and, and intercessors is the same stuff they do the same protocol the intercessory team is to understand when it might be a good idea for you just to sit in the audience a while 
You know, and I've had to walk up to people and say, not because you're in sin, but because you're in a need position right now, why don't you step down for a little while, get, get, some, get in the glory, get some things worked out, get some family matters straightened out, and then jump on back in. You know, because I don't want to penalize people because they're human. But at the same time, uh, there's one of the questions that, that, that I will address straight ahead. I won't even ask anybody to talk about that. Is it okay to have non-believers in your worship team? No. Okay? Worship, worship is not lifestyle evangelism. Worship is holy to the Lord. And as much as possible, those that are standing on stage holding microphones need to be in love with Jesus and they need to live right. And they, even if they're not perfect, uh, one of the things that, that, you know, we're dealing with more and more in church is, you know, we've always dealt with adultery and fornication, but we've always swept homosexuality and things like that under the rug. Homosexuality, I'm going to deal with a real nasty one here, is very predominant with musicians and, and art, art, artsy type people. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why, except that they're probably more experimental with, with their whole being, you know, whereas a guy who's on the other side of the brain, he's just kind of like a box factory guy. He never thinks outside the box. Musicians by virtue and artists and, and sometimes intercessors and different people, because they are called and gifted the way they are, they tend to color outside the box sometimes. And getting outside the box can get you in some trouble. It's not only in your gifting and creativity, but it's in every other aspect of your life. That, that desire to go outside the box sometimes is there. And the thing that I tell people who are dealing, uh, we had a young man who, was, who came to us early in the revival who, who uh, was dealing with homosexuality in his life. And, and he came straight out of a, a relationship. And he got saved and he got right with God. And I, I, I had such a compassion for him. I walked back to him one night. I said, can we talk a minute? So I got a couple of people in the office. And I said, can I explain something to you? He said, what? I said, it isn't over. I said, just be prepared. It isn't over. The old-fashioned thought that when God saves a homosexual, suddenly they're straight and they want to get married and have five kids is not necessarily always the case. There are deliverances like that, just like there are deliverances from alcohol where people never drink another drop. But there are others who struggle. They struggle. But the Bible is so clear on homosexuality and on any other thing like adultery and fornication, you cannot practice it and be part of the kingdom of heaven. So you must be abstinent. There is no way around it. And you must have accountability in your life. So, you know, you deal with these things. And, and the thing of it is for me is, is a person going after God with all their heart. If I know they're living in open sin, they're out of here. I have, to, I have to take them down. I don't want to, but I have to get them out of here, off the stage. But if they're struggling, they're not necessarily committing the act, but they're struggling in their lives, I'm not going to punish them for that. I'm going to encourage them and pray deliverance over them and see them walk out of their situation. But at the same time, I'm not going to put people who are really, when I say struggling, I, I don't mean going out and having affairs and doing things like that. But I'm not going to put someone, this is a vulnerable place. I think all of us, uh, Lori and I had a little talk last night. Attack of hell is what that is. We have all had hell. Last night after the service, Justin's brother, who's the drummer here, was in an accident and totaled his car. Our, our sound man. He's okay, Justin. His car is messed up. Is he a little sore? He was still in bed. Attack. Now, you know why I know that's attack? Because the devil can't steal him or kill him. Just distract him. Do you see what I mean? And you know what that's from? I'll tell you what, exactly what it's from. It's because I got bold last night. I feel responsible in some ways. I got bold and addressed some of the stuff that was going on. And I just went, expect it. We have all had just horrible things. This is a frontline position. That is a frontline position. The musicians in the Word of God went on the front line of battle. And, buddy, that's where the big guns are. That doesn't make us better than anybody else. I get the, we get the front of the service. You know, we, we set them up and the pastor knocks them down. Do you know what I'm saying? I've walked out here. We've walked out here all together with 
this room full and the room across the street full, 4,000 4, people are better on this campus. And some of them are not there because they want to be. They're there because they want to check it out. And we've got to stick our spiritual finger in the wind and go, okay, which way are you going, God? And some nights it just, it's like grinding battle, isn't it, Mike? Just all the way uphill, constant, never stops. It's, it's horrible. And then somewhere along you'll hit a vein and you'll hit a place where something happens. And, buddy, you just keep the needle there. You don't move. Man, once you hit a vein, you just stay there because that's what you're looking for. But, but to have someone, it's one thing to struggle. I've had, I'll never call names, but I've had people in the choir, people in the worship team who have had struggles in their life. If they felt their struggle and I felt their struggle was, was, was compromising enough for, their, 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 for them to get beat up bad by the devil, I'll ask them to take some time deal with the struggle and I can happily say that there's people that have that, that worship on the stage that maybe someone else would have just totally thrown away but we allowed them to have this time off get it all together and they're just wonderful because they they had a chance to get that straight didn't mean to go so long with that we've already dealt with your marriage situation I want you to know that before you got here yeah well I think that had to be somebody from the staff. That just sounds like. Okay, Lila, how about let's get something. Um, Mike, anytime you want to jump in, man, just don't talk too much, all right? Uh, another question. Who made the banners in the sanctuary? Uh, we have the old banners were made by a lady named Jennifer Colley, and she does that as did she make the new ones too? Okay, now they were screens. The new ones are silk screened. And uh, Lu Luis Lop Lopez is one of our church members, and he designed the artwork and did the silk screening. And then I think uh, Jennifer Colley did the, uh, the actual putting together. And I think she has information. Uh, I don't know where it's at. Uh, <laughs> just call the office. They can tell you. I apologize. But I, that's who made them. Uh, manifestations. Why do the intercessors wave at times of prayer? Can manifestations be a learned response? Yes. Uh, what scriptures do you have to back up manifestations of twitching? Are you giving that one to me? Well, <laughs> you're the, hey, you're the queen twitcher. <laughs> Lindell twitch a time or two himself. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think manifest, like, like the question is, is it learned behavior? I think that possibly, you know, as far as manifestations are concerned, that's no big deal to me. I've been in Pentecost for 40 years, and I saw a whole lot of this stuff before this current move. I think, I think the concern in this current move of God is that we have a whole lot of people that were not familiar with, uh, with the old time Pentecost and, uh, uh, and, and it seems like it's something brand new. But my, um, my response to that would be that it's, it's your reaction to the Holy Spirit moving on you. And that's why one person may twitch, one person may jerk, may, and, and we're not going to doctrinalize it or anything. It's, uh, it's not that the Holy Spirit is making you do this specifically, but when His presence comes on you, there's just going to be, there will always be some sort of reaction. And I don't know whether that's going to be satisfactory or not, but... Um, well, the, the, the thing, too, you know, you look at that Saul's conversion. Sure. You know, that was a, 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 a crazy thing where he Radical. actually gets scales on his eyes. And then the Lord told him to go down and a particular man and I would pray for him and he would be... Mm -hmm. The Bible has certain things, but, you know, I don't think in the, in the limited amount of time in the Bible it was necessary like in the second chapter of Acts where uh, the scripture, if you really study that, do you think about that? Now just think, if you, whoever asked this question is asking it from a very uh, uh, intellectual point of view. So look at the second chapter of Acts from an intellectual point of view. 120 people were in an upper room, which means a high room. They were praising the Lord and a sound came from heaven like a rushing mighty wind filled the house where they were sitting they and clothed in tongues or 
like something that looked like fire sat upon them and they began to speak in tongues as the spirit gave utterance but then the next few verses you see that peter feels obligated to stand up and explain what has happened however the bible doesn't really say how three thousand plus people wound up at the upper room did you notice that left out some vital information there because it didn't feel like it was vital because they figure the writer was feeling like with a noise and the speaking in tongues and obviously people acting drunk was enough of a spectacle to draw three to five thousand people that Peter felt the need to stand up and go these men are not drunk that was his first words they're not drunk with wine as you suppose so do you think they were manifesting maybe What does a drunk do? Sings, falls down, staggers. But see, mainline denominations don't want to talk about that. They just read over that in a religious way. But think about it a minute. I mean, would you come out for just somebody singing a hymn and praying under their breath? No. So there you have it. I just have one more thing to say. We don't ever seem to speak up about people that get drunk in the world or, or take drugs or anything like that. And that's only a counterfeit of the real thing, which is the Holy Spirit. And that was first. And so I think we need to embrace that and begin to pray for, for the, the counterfeit and not make such a spectacle of the Lord because he had all that first. And that's just our way of reacting to the real presence of God. The world is only a counterfeit. So that's all. I'm moving fast. Dace, our sound system keeps blowing out equal equalizers. Therefore, we don't use one anymore. That's, that's the solution. <laughs> I like that. I'm not trying to make fun of you. I, I, please. I never thought of that. That's a good idea. Any ideas on why this could be happening? Uh, how do you convince a congregation you need a new sound system? Oh, yeah. Take it away, Dace. Uh, well, my technical opinion on that first question would be um, that something's not right. I'd say with that one, something's not right. <laughs> oh gosh, that I mean that could be a ton of things. You you'd really just have to have someone come in and look at that. Um, the the second part would probably be addressed, I think, maybe a little better. The, I mean, if you want to invest in a sound system, that's great, but you got to understand you're working with people, and you need to invest in people. That's my personal opinion. And, I mean, Lindell's got great gear over there, but if you get, you know, me to go over there and play it, it ain't going to work. It's just not going to happen. So you need to invest in people. You need to have the dedication to your sound people to, to say, hey, let's, let's get someone to come in to teach them something. Let's give them some resources in their hands. Let's acknowledge them. Let's, let's make them proud about, about the work that they're doing. And then when the time comes and you need equipment, you've got the people there who can run it and you're not you know, back there with Joe Plummer who you're blessing their heart all day and all week uh, when the time comes on. So you really, I think you should just, you know, really invest in people and, but understand that it is going to take money. It takes a lot of money and time to keep what we have here going. We've had things break during this week, um, but yeah, that's what we're here for. So you just, uh, you need to let the pastor know, hey, we have a sound that God wants to hear and that the congregation needs to hear. And the sound system's a tool to use that, to use to get that sound across. Last night was a lot of fun. Last night was great, and it was loud in here, I know. But it was, it was a lot of fun, and we have a great sound system here. It's, it would be like a Ferrari, you know, if you, if you wanted to look at it that way. But you can't have an eight-year-old kid expect him to drive it. You know, it's, you need to really just invest and put time into people. He's, so. he's, what he's, if you understand that clearly... Because there's several questions here, Dace, and the one right below it said, should a small church invest a lot of money in a sound system, and how essential is this? Uh, the bottom line there is a rule of thumb. Now, this is kind of some people go by it. 
whatever it costs you to invent to install your sound system figure five percent of it a year for maintenance so if you spend ten thousand dollars on your sound system then then you're going to probably spend 500 to a thousand probably five to ten percent five hundred a thousand a year keeping that that system up it's a black hole it never stops if you you know and and what he's saying is so true and that was great days i I've never thought of that. Good point. Because people get sound systems and nobody knows how to run them. And that nothing, the worst thing than not having a sound system is having one nobody can run. You know? And, and so somebody asked me a good question. Dace, you just brought all kinds of light in here. Thank you, buddy. Because someone asked me, well, should we have a monitor board? Well, do you have somebody who can run it? Do they understand what it is? Good point. Okay. Do you think a banjo could be incorporated into worship? If you're from Tennessee. <laughs> Absolutely. It's an instrument, isn't it? Why not? Just do something where they can do kind of a hee-haw thing. It'll be great. I like banjo. I just never thought about adding it into... Okay, we've already addressed under believers being a part. We have a senior pastor who allows everything but is not in the worship and does not take authority before the congregation. As a result, people look at the associate pastor to set the worship, the direction for worship. As a worship leader, one often feels guilty of taking too much authority. How do you deal with this situation? Please know that the relationship between the senior pastor and worship leader is good. Alvin? Alvin. You haven't messed with one yet. Alvin is on green. <laughs> um, I'm a stickler on authority. Um, that's just, I believe that wherever God places you and, and senior pastor, he is responsible for the sheep. He is responsible for that flock. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to always agree, that we're going to gel together. You know, I've, I've been a worship leader for a long time uh, under several pastors, and i got to tell you that I haven't always agreed. How many can say amen? All right. Um, but we need to have the right attitude. We need, have to, we need to have the right spirit. And we have to recognize his authority. He's going to give account for the sheep when he faces Jesus. What we need to do is, with a good attitude, with a good spirit, we need to communicate where we're at. Behind closed doors. And one of four things is going to happen as far as uh, worship in that congregation. Number one, God will change his heart. Or number two, God will change your heart. Or number three, God will move him. Or number four, God will move you. It's one of the four. But if we're going to minister in the church, I don't care whatever capacity, I believe the Lord has placed a shepherd, and it's our responsibility to be submissive to that shepherd and allow God. God, you know, God can do the impossible. And sometimes we think, oh, God will never change his heart. Or God will never change your heart. Sometimes it's not so much the pastor that needs to change. We need to change. So. Real quick, too, the, one of the best things to do is pray for your pastor. And also, if you have a good relationship with your pastor, you probably talk quite often. And maybe he mentors you on a few things or, you know, talks about the service. And maybe that would be a good opportunity to just share what God's sharing with you about worship and maybe teach him a little bit back and forth about worship. He can teach you about some other things. And also, one of the highest forms of worship is perfect obedience. And that's not just to God, but to the people in authority over you. And don't don't just think that worship is music. So if you're leading the congregation to be obeying that pastor, you are leading them in worship because it's not just about the music. If you're all subjecting to his authority, that's one of the highest forms of worship you can lead in. So be encouraged. Uh, Jesse, go on, elaborate on this. Just you're right there at it. What are the steps of getting a senior pastor to evolve from old traditional religious devotion to a worship setting? 
I'm not really sure because we just all kind of got blasted. So I don't know. <laughs> we all kind of got out of tradition at the same time. In fact, our pastor was the one who led us to get out of tradition. So I don't, I don't really know how to answer that. Well, one. I think number one, getting a pastor to do anything is the wrong approach because uh, it's, yeah. it comes back to that friendship thing. If you, if, if you have a, you must develop a friendship with the leader because if you're the worship leader, meaning you're leading worship every service and he's preaching most of the services, then you two have half of the service. One has one half, one has the other. And if you all aren't on the same page, then you're gonna have your agenda and he's gonna have his. Well, first of all, you should never have your agenda. You should have his even if it's not what you like. And then what you're challenged to do is to be a friend to him or her and direct them by, not direct them, but open them up to some things. Say, hey, let me take you to this worship conference to show you this. Well, what do you think about this? This is what the Lord is doing. My father and I, when I was a young boy, when, when this worship thing started happening, we were very traditional. We sang everything out of the book, out of the hymn book. Dad was afraid the tithers would leave if I started singing those worship choruses. It was okay to sing Glory, Glory, Hallelujah, since I laid my burden down, and it was okay to sing uh, Reach Out and Touch the Lord as He Walks By or Sweep Over My Soul. Those were choruses, but those weren't those worship choruses that had the Bible in them. And one day I told Dad, I said, so it's better to sing about the Lord than to sing His Word, right? Because dad's and sons, you know. So I, I did a rebellious thing that I don't recommend you doing. One Sunday morning, I just pulled out. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. The church loved it. My dad thought all the tithers would leave. I had to repent for my rebellion afterwards. But in that case, it, it was, we were a family, so, you know, we could slug it out. Um, but, but the thing of it is, is be a friend to your pastor and, and try to expand it. Another question, question here concerning that that I can address is, uh, what's the purpose of putting on a, a worship conference? Uh, it's our hope, not that we have the know-how, but what we have here is a vision and a touch of the Lord. And we know that you and, you're not going to go home and implement all this because there's no way it would ever work in your church. We know that, but part of these kind of conferences are really just to allow you to kind of stick your head in here for two or three days and see what we're doing. And there may be things that you could glean from it because the biggest issue we're about here is motivation of the heart, worshiping the Lord, and giving him all the glory and not performing. So this has not been a performance conference. Now you'll go to other conferences that'll be better They'll be more organized. They'll be more prepared. They'll have pyrotechnics and lights and strobe lights. And, and I'm not against any of that. Praise God, whatever works. But ours is more of an organic kind of thing that just says, you know, we're here to kick back and worship the Lord. That's what we are. I, I, I'll tell you this, someone who impressed me and blessed me is John Wimber. And this is not a vineyard church. But if I probably connect with anybody in the area of worship, it's probably John Wimber. And it's, it's my desire to not be performancy. However, I don't mind a good performance number every now and again. Uh, I would probably be much more aggressive musically than John Wimber was. But at the same time, his basic principles blessed me. I think God sent him as an apostle to the body to bring us a truth that we all needed and listen. That stream of, of John Wimber and the vineyard runs through this revival. It's, it's here. And there's a part of it. And it's, it's, it's manifesting itself in these musicians, these players, these writers. It's, it's just here. And it's part of that stream flowing together. Okay, moving on. Go ahead. That, that one, I, I, this is a good one. This is not a question for the sake of controversy or argument, but rather search for biblical understanding and correctness. We often refer to the Holy Spirit coming down or coming in or some other similar phrase. But doesn't the Holy Spirit already live and dwell within us? So the Holy Spirit coming down or so is the Holy Spirit coming down or are we, or are we going into his presence? What does the Bible say is happening? Does it address this issue? 
Well, that's been left to me. And could I say something concerning um, the conference? One of the things that uh, you probably noticed is we have made ourselves totally vulnerable. And this is like our living room. And we have invited you in with the comfort of, uh, of sharing our, ourselves very transparently with you. And I, I know probably that's um, a dangerous place in some ways. But um, we wanted you more than anything to have your heart touched and to see as um, as Lendl said it's not about uh, people it's not about music it's not about intercession it's about him and that uh, worship out of the heart that has been transformed and tenderized and circumcised is where everything is going to come from and as I listen to each of the speakers uh, the emphasis was always upon heart issues and I think if, if we haven't done anything this week um, except this one thing, and which I think is the most important, and that is uh, to direct you with a, a road sign very large to our own heart and motivation. And out of that will come whatever ingredients are necessary for your congregation after you've been messed with that will um, have an effect on your, your church and your city. The question about the Holy Spirit coming down and coming in and all of that. Um, I was reminded of the scripture when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus. He said, the Holy Spirit comes, you know, observe the wind. It comes and it goes and, and uh, the Holy Spirit can't be contained in that respect. And so he is everywhere at all times and at, in all places. He's inside, outside, through. Are you following me? Uh, and to actually put um, a uh, emphasis on uh, coming down or, or coming up, we use all of those metaphors because we have such pitiful language skills to speak of spiritual things. And uh, in that, when we begin to see things from that perspective, it is like he comes in sometime. I, I can't explain it. I'm sure you experienced it. We call it better felt than telt or, you know, uh, caught than taught, however you want to say it. Uh, but I think that you've seen the dynamics of that occur in this room. We all came in with the Holy Spirit. If we're believers in Jesus, we carry his presence. We all came in with, our, with the Holy Spirit inside of us, but something happened in the atmosphere where we experienced something deeper than what we had internal. Can you say amen on that? I think, and so to actually actually address this from a theological um, perspective, uh, I really can't tell you what is happening. But um, there are certain times the Lord says to, to seek the Lord while he may be found. Now we know he's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, all of those things. But there are certain seasons and times when his presence is more readily available. I think we've experienced that on an individual and collective basis. And I believe that we are in a time right now where a window of opportunity to know the Lord in a fresh, brand new way. He's, he's the eternal, you know, the eternal one that's always the same and never changes, but, but because we don't know him and all the aspects of who he is and it's going to take all of eternity to reveal that he just is re is letting us touch a little bit of him here and there and i don't know about you but i say god if it's come in come out you know fly up to him him come down i don't care how as long as his presence is here and our lives are changed and the nations of the world are changed amen that's all i care about um. I'm going to jump all over the gambit here because we got a lot of questions. We're not going to get through them if we don't roll. Uh, no, not, I wouldn't say anything about you, Miss Lila. Uh, there was a good one right before you there, Miss Lila, that, that I think it, that, that I, I know it's probably your domain, but I want to, uh, inter I want to say something about it. Um, if dur during intercession you are travailing and the sound you make sounds... Um, spooky or eerie should you pray god will give you a different sound that's more pleasing <laughs> i'm in your territory but i i know a little something about that uh because really i, I want to tell you something my grandmother was a travailer in the lord and occasionally an old-time pentecost when i was a boy 
the spiritual travail would come upon me. And you have to understand, intercession and travail can become very close to each other and, and, and manifest. Uh, you can, during intercession, you can manifest travail. And let's talk about travail, ladies. Is that pleasing to the ear? I was there when my baby was born, and I, I was about to die because I, I thought Amber, I thought she's not going to make it through this. And she was so calm and collected, but man, when those pains came, it came out of her. And, and, and the scripture talks about us travailing to see sons and daughters born. And uh, during worship, I, I think that you have to have leadership. The thing I love about our intercessory group is we have leadership. And if someone is doing, like I have intercessors in my choir, and what I ask them to do, you know, is if you really go into a manifestation or a travail in the middle of a time when no one else is doing it, just step out and go right there into the stairwell and just don't stop. Just go right there and then let's see if everybody else goes in with you. And when they do, then who cares what you do? You know what I mean? Because we don't want to, I don't care about scaring people. Let me tell you what America's ready for. They're ready for some supernatural. And the church is supposed to be displaying the power of God. And you know what? That little man with a diaper that everybody's reading, Dalai Lama, and all these guys. <laughs> He's, they're not ashamed to talk about their, cha their channeling and getting in touch and the um and the yoga and all that. The world is not ashamed of that. They talk about it freely and openly. What is wrong with us in the church? where we're afraid we'll scare somebody off. You know what, we might just scare somebody in. You know, the, how many of us, I mean, how many of y'all were, were not from a, a, a church background and you went to a church, I know, and, and boy, something weird happened and you, you were scared by it, but you came back because you felt something you didn't explain and you had to come, what's that? Father's Day. It was weird. But people had to come and see the weird. And it's not, you don't do weird to make people come. But when God comes and it's weird, it's going to be weird. He's God and we're people. Come on, folks. This is my one complaint. And I'm going to say this. I'm not afraid to say it. This is my problem with America Mainline Church. We, I love the fact that, that the evangelicals in our churches love the Word of God and they want to be biblically correct. I love that. And we've got to have that. We cannot err from Scripture. We cannot for one minute err from Scripture. But we also can't bottle, bottle God and tell God either you got to do, if they didn't do it in the Bible, then you can't do it. Well, then I'm asking the, the people who say that, then why aren't you doing what they did in the Bible? When's the last time you raised the dead in your church? When's the last time we did? When's the last time somebody came in and said, I was coming, I was coming to say some horrible things in the paper and write some nasty things about the church and God smote me with blindness and told me that I needed to come here and have you pray for me. Folks, for all the church of Christ, that's New Testament. I want you to know that. It's New Testament. Are you doing it? I'm not just saying it to everyone else. I'm saying it to the Assemblies of God, the Pentecostals, the Charismatic. Are you a bunch of noise and fluff with no power? And that's the thing that frustrates us here. Because we have seen God move, but we haven't still seen the power we want to see. And, and, and we're miserable. Lori and I talked about it last night. We're just miserable with ourselves. We're just absolutely miserable. And you know what? It's got to have. we got to be miserable. we got to be miserable because that's the only way it's going to happen is to get miserable. And say, God, if you don't come, we're going to die. If you don't do it, we're going to die. <laughs> I'm sorry. I felt my preach get on me a little bit there. Hey, Linda. Linda. Can I say one thing about Please. this whole manifestation thing? Be very, very careful not to put a label on what you see somebody expressing outwardly, that that's the glory. 
Somebody can be experiencing the glory by sitting in their pew, weeping silently, and have just as much a touch of glory on their lives as somebody who is shaking violently. So be very careful that you don't you know, go with what you're seeing and judge somebody or judge what's going on by what you see because that can be a trap. We've seen hundreds of people walk in here and jerk violently that weren't even Christians. Sure. I mean, they weren't even Christians. Boy, it got quiet, didn't it? They weren't Christians. And their testimony was on Friday night at the baptismal pool. I came in here and I went up to get prayer because, I mean, who don't need prayer? You know what I mean? I came up to get prayer and I couldn't stand up anymore and I fell. One lady, she said, I, I laid in the floor and my body convulsed and I couldn't stop it. She said, I didn't even know God. So manifestations mean nothing. So get over it. It's a response to what God's doing. It's a physical response to a spiritual action. And that's all there is to it. Musician, I got a musician question. Hallelujah. Um, where do we get the words to I will rejoice? She's got them and we've got them. And they're coming out on a recording. Uh, musicians, there was something about musicians that I just felt the Lord wanted to say. Um, okay, why don't you guys jump on this one? Explain why musicians need not to do their own thing. And be, but be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Do you call the shots on how a song or a music is played? Who makes the changes? Just any of you musicians, just jump right on that one. Charlie? Yeah, because some of you weren't in that session. Here's Charlie's answer. Yesterday, I kind of I kind of talked a little bit on the fact of... Um, how every person has something they can add to the sound and if if you focus on more of of what you can do to help the total band sound than what you can do to stand out and and have a cool part or whatever because that'll that'll happen sometime eventually but if you focus more on having a part that mixes in and helps the total sound of the band then um that's um more of that's kind of what i said yesterday thanks charlie Charity. Somebody wants to know about Charity. She's married. She married a worship leader, and they're, I don't know if they're working at church, but they were living in Crestview. They're still doing really well, sweet as ever. So Charity's great. She's, she's a wife now. She sang Mercy Feet Seat the first time in this revival. She was 14. Can you believe that? I'm starting to feel old. Uh, we know it's not about the music, but aren't there anointed songs? Is, is, is it not really an anointed song? Is it just about a season? You've done a great job showing us at, that worship is an attitude, but can you clarify this point? Yes, there are anointed songs. There are songs that God likes. Really, there are some, and that's all anointed song is. It's his favorites. See, understand, you're like God. You have favorites, he has favorites. He's no respecter of persons. He loves everybody. But he has moods, he has anger, he has laughter. He wanted to kill all the Israelites. Moses talked him out of it. He was angry. I thought, I thought God was more rational than that. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to do. But no, it's not about the music, but there are seasons. Yes, seasons and yes, songs. Uh, we will ride that horse song sang it forever and you know what's funny after six years i still sing it and get the, the same thing happens god must really like that song and i know that people have written me and said well that's not necessarily biblical well talk to god about it he likes it <laughs> you know it's just something he sends us just throw his glory on and and I feel like, I think Mike and, uh, Mike and uh, Jesse have written a couple songs for here that you've heard this week. A couple in particular, I Will Rejoice. God likes that song. He, she just may as well get used to singing it. Just don't get tired of it because God likes that song. 
Mike's, Mike's song, uh, Day After Day, Your Love is Higher Than the Mountains. God likes that song. I mean, so yes, the answer to that. Uh, Lila, you had some quick ones you wanted to hit. That's no, that's not a cue. You just said you were going to touch uh, on them. I would like to reach back into uh, one of the questions, I suppose it could be uh, in both directions, talk about worship evangelism, taking the music ministry outside the four walls of the church. And uh, what have you done? Can you suggest books or other resources to learn about it and so on? Um, what we have done here is we're trying to take not only the worship but intercession outside the church. And uh, we have done some things in stadiums similar to what you saw last night. Yeah, last night was kind of a... Abbreviated. Uh, uh, we've been taking it to cities. Uh, in um, Last year and again this year in our own city, we'll be doing an, an outdoor meeting this year. Uh, hopefully on uh, Halloween evening here at one of the uh, football stadiums. Amen. <clears throat> and um, that will be um, kind of a counter whatever <laughs> that'll be going on that night and an open stadium so that the worship and intercession will just be out there in the, in the air. And uh, so yes, we are. And he is doing things like that. There are some questions here about um, uh, actually some protocol. Lyndall uh, handled a lot of it there in, in his session, so we're not going to have to go into detail. And many of the questions that are here I have, hand, I have um, addressed in the series that I have on intercession uh, training series. And it would take a long time to make uh, comments on, on each of these subjects, but uh, intercession going on during the service, uh, if you're making travailing sounds, uh, should you yield to the Holy Spirit in a public place? There is a decorum and a protocol. And uh, in joining our team, which has the same, um, shall we say, requirements as uh, the other departments, that would be that they need to go through cleansing streams. We have uh, restrictions on what, we're, uh, what we are uh, allowed to do, so to speak. Uh, one of the things is uh, that intercession, as wonderful it is, as it is, unless it's been released into the congregation like you saw last night, the spirit of travail just came in and, 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 and swept over the people and the children were moving. But that is not the common uh, thing that occurs in our, in our meetings because intercession, uh, as, as wonderful as it is, can be a distraction for people, especially if we have an evangelistic type meeting and uh, they'll, they'll start centering on what's going on rather than the word that's being presented. That was especially true when Steve was here every night with the strong evangelistic word and all of our intercessors and I'd like, I'd like our, our team to stand. Let's see. We got, yeah, we got intercessors, part of our team. Some of our leaders are here. Amen. Praise God. And you see some of the intercessors are also part of the worship team. And so what we've done is uh, we've worked very hard to train um, leaders that uh, are able to handle everything I do better than I do. And uh, we have a team of probably close to 100 people. And we have uh, met every night of revival prior to the service. Some of uh, you probably have been wondering, do we meet during, and are we interceding during the service? Sometimes if the Holy Spirit draws. But what we found, because we had to go long term, um, this is six years, going to be starting the seventh year. And at first we had uh, people interceding through the whole service every night. And I saw, especially with young intercessors, that it was becoming uh, so hard because it was constant work at that time. We hadn't developed as much the worship type of intercession that we do now. And um, what I saw was, uh, was a weariness coming upon the intercessors, and I conversed with my pastor, and uh, su he suggested, and we, we agreed, that we have the intercession for two or three hours prior to the evening service. And it was just such a boost for our intercessors because the things that were, were brought and prayed out during the service, the way were, or before the service, they would, were able to see many nights uh, actually translated during the service. You know what I'm saying? They would see that things that were prayed ha happen in the service, and it was a real boost for them individually and collectively. And so um, what, we, what we ask is if the intercessors, if, if, it, if it's not corporately poured out the, the, the manifestation type thing of, of the travail and so on, and our intercessors feel that that's 
a part of what they're experiencing or something that would draw attention, uh, they know to go out. This is a part of our team. They know that's a part of, of the training. They, they are to dismiss themselves from the room and go somewhere else and, and let it happen. Um, I have, in the series, we, t we tell you how to tell you. We suggest what we did here. And uh, if you're interested in setting up your intercessory prayer, groups. Uh, there will be suggestions as to some of the things you can offset because there, some of the questions here are, uh, what if you have problem people? Well, with the uh, requirements that we have here, not only for choir and worship, but for also intercession, uh, has helped to eliminate considerably when you've screened the people thoroughly. Now, we have interviews. Uh, we, everyone has to fill out an application. They have, uh, they are required to go through cleansing streams prior to, to joining the team. Uh, they, at, in the application, we have a secondary uh, one that's kind of a, a generic one for everyone that works at Brownsville, but we have a secondary intercession question. Uh, what is your family life like? Um, we probe a little bit deeper. Uh, what are your, uh, do you have prejudices, racial, gender? denominational, all those things would be disqualifying. If you have gone through that, then we, uh, we go to the process of interviews. Two of the intercessors on the team will do the interview with a, second, with a third one sitting there listening. You know, people can look really good on paper. People can look really good on paper. But uh, the actual one-on-one -on -one interview will probe a little bit deeper. The photograph is taken if, and, uh, and taken to the, our cell pastors or if they're from the school of ministry and, so that uh, we can identify who they are and then we have to have an approval from their, their headship. You say, oh, that sounds so restrictive. Well, we've got a lot to lose. And I personally believe that the prayer room needs to be the cleanest place in the whole house. Amen. As Lyndall uh, speaks concerning worship, uh, the intercession, though it's, it's kind of the back room, this is the front room. Uh, and everything in between, you know, will be affected by what happens in these two places. Um, I was asked here about, did you want me to just go, on, go down the list a little, little bit? Yeah, did you want? A couple more. All right. Uh, I was asked about uh, some of the CDs concerning the nations. Um, we collect them from other countries, and so if you'll if you'll just get, a, you know, pull up my website, uh, there'll be a or a cross pollination, or cross poly c r o s s p o l l i at aol dot com, uh, there. Uh, and ask that question specifically. I have some Ireland tapes out on my table, but that's all I have right now. But we like to try to make them available, and, and uh, we can refer you to uh, places that you can get them. Um, there are some specific books that I would recommend. Um, I love Glory because that, uh, from Ruth Ward Heflin, that has really helped us to get the intercession worship connection. Uh, Dutch Sheets has an excellent book called Intercessory Prayer. Very, very good. Um, Alice Smith has one called um, Beyond the Veil, which I would recommend very highly. Uh, Rees Howell, that would just be an, uh, uh, yeah, that would be something that, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, I think Norman Grubb is the author. I don't, I don't know whether we have that book available in the book room or not, but these are some books that I would, I would uh, highly recommend. Um, Yes, we do have uh, training, training programs for intercessors. Um, there will be, I'll be teaching a course at BRSM this next semester on intercessory prayer. Um, one of the things that I wanted to address, uh, Lila, is their unsafe warfare. And I think any of you that have heard me address this in the past, you know, just get ready for, to hear it again. But I think it's something that's very important. I go I travel a lot, and uh, I see intercessors all over the world that are just beat up and, and, and just full of all kinds of uh, problems because they faced off uh, with the principalities and the powers in their city, you know, and they've done this, the, uh, uh, the bestsellers' suggestions. And might I add, there are so many books out there on spiritual warfare, and I'm not against spiritual warfare. I mean, hey, I, am, I love a good fight, but I'm not going to pick one that I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to win. And um, so unless we are specifically led to do, you know, a, a warfare type type uh, intercession, we stay in the in the realm of the heavenlies. 
in the area of, uh, of uh, the worship. And I can tell you from a personal experience, I learned the hard way uh, when we were living in Mississippi a few years ago. I had come from California where I taught a lot about spiritual warfare and all that type thing. And um, so I, I decided when we moved to the small Piney Wood community in Mississippi that the first thing that they needed to learn was intercession. I began to teach on spiritual warfare. Now I had no, uh, no intercession covering. Uh, I didn't have, I had people who were wonderful godly people but they didn't have a clue about what I was talking about. And I had uh, actually come to the conclusion when we moved to this small community that I had landed in a Frank Peretti novel. Yeah. It was that kind of an atmosphere, and I said, my goodness, you know, with this benign uh, covering uh, facade on the top, but I said, there's darkness and powers and principalities, and, and you know, it was just uh, so obvious to me, and I was going to teach these people, okay? So I began to teach on, on spiritual warfare, and this one night, I had been teaching for two or three weeks, and this one night, I'm, I'm determined that I'm going to reveal the spirits, and it wasn't too hard, you know, all you do is look at the, the people and you can see the influence that's over that community. The people will reflect what's, what, what's the strength of the end. So, you know, we're talking prejudice, we're talking poverty, we're talking, uh, you know, um, bigotry, we're, we're speaking. And so we begin to, to, to call out and identify these things. And um, the people are looking at me like deer in a headlight. What in the world are you talking about? And at that point, I felt something come into the room, literally wrap itself around me, and I couldn't go on any farther. And I, I just, I, I knew the presence of darkness had been summoned, and guess who was the target? Okay, and so I'm standing there, and I said, all right, now, now everybody pray. I said, I, I really feel like, you know, something's coming against me. They prayed, and I felt it lift. Well, we go home that night, and in the middle of the night, I heard an audible voice. I don't hear God's voice, you know, but I heard an audible voice saying, Run for your life. Get out of here as fast as you can. And with that, I sat up bolt upright in the bed, and my heart is practically pounding out of my chest. And the spirit of fear came upon me. Now, I knew that that was not God's voice. But what I had done, stupidly, ignorantly, is I had, uh, without intercession covering, without direction by the Holy Spirit, I had stepped into a realm that I had no business being in. And it was like going, hey, you guys, come here. Here I am. And I want to tell you, for about nine months at least, I was on a runaway. And uh, I thought, my husband thought I was having a nervous breakdown. Uh, everything that was going on uh, in, in, in my life, even though probably to the exterior for those that did not know me, it looked all right. But I was wanting to run and to get out of there as fast as I can. It came to the place where uh, every time uh, my husband would go to the, <laughs> to the post office and here would be stacks of real estate information from other states. Uh, and uh, finally he said, hey, are you getting ready to leave me? Or, I mean, you know, what is this? Are you going somewhere? And I said, well, well, no, I just was wondering, well, what is the property like, um, oh, in, New, in, in um, New Mexico? You know, maybe we, and so this had gone on and on and on, and he could see I was really in bad shape. And he would pray for me, and it would lift, but it was like, I could not get away. I've got to get out of here. And one of the things that we need to understand, the Holy Spirit leads but the devil drives. And I was being driven, and I, I couldn't even remember all these scriptures I had so powerfully taught and all that. And my husband comes home one, one day, and I've got a map out of a state I don't even like to drive across. And I've got the telephone in my hand, and he just stepped in, and he said, listen. This is why we, my husband's sitting over there right now. <laughs> and he said, listen, this has got to stop. Because he looked at the, the state, he said, what is this? What are you doing? I said, well, I was calling to see about what the, what the property was like, you know, over uh, there might be some, ha he said, this has got to end, Lila. He said, I want you to do this. I will move you anywhere in the world that you want to go. But you have to tell me that it's God speaking to you. Well, he jerked my chain. Oh! <laughs> I mean, you know, I had one of those, uh, those breakdowns. It went a Holy Ghost break. It was a pity party to the max, okay? And I'm weeping and bawling and crying. And I said, no, I can't say that. I can't say that. But I can't stand it anymore. 
Well, what happened is at that point, it was like I just gave up. And I said, God, I can't, I, I can't stay here and I can't go any place. I'm just going to have to give it to you. At that point, a divine intervention came, and I heard of a, of a prayer meeting that was in Mobile, Alabama at Life Church. And I showed up there on a Tuesday morning. Not one single person knew me. But when I stepped through the door, it was like, oh, God. You know, I felt the familiar presence of the Holy Spirit when you're around intercessors. And I knew that this was a place that I needed to be. And that morning, the leader, her name is um, Wynette Workman, a lovely lady that was conducting the meeting. And she saw me, and she said, honey, you, you. And she had me stand up. And uh, it was like a breath of fresh air. And, and she, had me, she called me out with a prophetic word. And the Lord said, you are exactly where you're supposed to be for right now. But there's going to be a slight geographical change. And the church you will be in is larger than the city that you now live in. And that was just a few months before we were invited to come to Brownsville. But what it did, it lifted that because my fear had been, and this is what the enemy had been saying, you're in the wrong place, you've missed God. And when I knew we were in the right place, I was content to live there for the rest of my life. You see what I'm saying? And at that point, the Lord set me free. And so I would challenge you to uh, steer as clear from that kind of activity as possible. Now, I've gotten reports. I remember a pastor called me one day, and he wanted to know um, his, the head of his intercessory prayer group, and she was new in their, in their town, and he really didn't know what was going on. They had taken her to the, the, um, the hospital that morning because she had had a breakdown of some sort. And I asked him, I said, has she been doing some kind of spiritual warfare, and, and you know, have they been challenging principal? He said, you know, it's a distinct possibility. He said, I, you know, when they took her away, you know, she had some Messiah complex on I mean, it was way out there. And he was asking me, should he go and deliver her in the hospital? And I said, you know, Pastor, that is a question only you can answer. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure that somewhere something has broken down, and I don't know what her mental position and condition was before that. But uh, I suggested to him that he take a CD player into that, into that room and begin to play worship music and begin to speak, oh, yes, blessings, because it's blessings that will counsel cancel the curses and when we begin to learn about the the power of blessings so much more than confronting powers and principalities we need to be speaking blessings over our city we need to be speaking blessings over our churches because when we understand that the power of God is more powerful than the power of the enemy and it will begin to to disarm the things that uh, that we have have controlling our cities and I hope that uh, if, if I didn't say anything else today I wanted to impart that into you uh, so that you will be very careful in your activities concerning powers and principalities and rulers over your city is that okay that's awesome praise God I want to I want to address a couple things and then we want to we want to kind of wrap this up we didn't get to every question we're trying hard but I also want to open the floor up after we address a couple of questions here. And all any of you over there, any of you back here, if you have something you want to just say before we quit, I want you to feel free to do that, okay? Be thinking about it. Uh, I can answer several little questions really, really fast. And uh, what's a good time, what's a good length of time for worship on a regular basis? Depends on where you are. Uh, because someone said to me, uh, there's another question, is there, uh, we only, can you really enter into worship in 20 or 30 minutes? Yes. You can enter into what worship with whatever the authority over you has given you time to do in. Because God will honor you honoring the time that you've been given. God will honor that. And it's hard because I go places sometimes and I'm used to Brownsville. I can just go until I'm finished. But then I go to places, they go, you got 30 minutes. And, uh, you know, we were at a place just recently where we had 45 minutes. And I thank God showed up. You know, you, so just honoring what you're given. And, and there's not really a, a said time. But, but by all means, please, just shut up if it ain't happening, okay? Stop. You don't have to do your full hour. That's another thing I want to address. Um, how much exhortation... Um, how much preaching exhortation should a worship leader give and how did 
do you encourage the congregation to worship without hounding them about what they're, they're not worshiping, about the fact that they're not worshiping? Uh, you make the enemy of a con you make an enemy of a congregation when you're constantly yelling at them about worship, and you have a way of of getting angry at them because they're not responding the way you think they ought to. Uh, you know, you sing you sing your your big song, and you're expecting them to just jump jump out of their pews, and sometimes they don't, and 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 the Lord is not interested in your big song, and and the thing that you have to understand is. Another thing about exhortation, I do it a little different than Jesse and Alvin. Like Alvin seems to, ex I haven't seen you lead worship a lot recently, but he exhorts more than I do. Uh, she exhorts a lot more than I do. I don't exhort that much unless I really feel the Lord has given me something because my tendency is to talk too much. <laughs> it's a natural tendency. I love to talk and I love to preach and, uh, and you know, I'm not going to take my worship time as my opportunity to get my two cents worth in because it's a, it's a form of manipulation. And one thing I hate is manipulation. I hate it. I, I see it as a, as, a, as a very serious problem in the church. And that's the reason a lot of times you all get, you, know, you think he's goofy. A lot of that is premeditated because I will absolutely do things to deflate your idea that I'm super spiritual because I don't want you to think that I'm super spiritual because I'm not. I'm just a regular guy. I love the Lord. I love to lead worship. I don't walk out of the prayer closet and my family all bow down. I, I, you know, I don't. I try to live in the spirit and I try to live right, but I'm not some ooey gooey guru kind of guy. And I've hung around those kind. But you know what I found out? Somebody somewhere is seeing them be real. They just aren't letting me see it. Thing, the thing that I choose to do with you is to allow you to come in here and see someone real. And what I want to do is also, if God don't do it, I don't want to. And you, let me tell you, look, this is important. You can get into a habit of exhorting people. And your filler words can become dead religion and monotony. How many worship leaders, when they finish a song, they go, hallelujah, they don't mean it. And I'm telling you, the scripture talks about every idle word, and we always think it's curse words. But see, the Holy Spirit knows if you're real, if you really mean hallelujah. When you really mean hallelujah, it, it has a life to it. But if you're just filling time, hallelujah, bless the Lord, thank you, Jesus, you don't mean it. And I purposed in my heart when this revival began that I was not going to prop people up, because I did that for years. I did it for years. Come on in here. Let's just glorify God. Come on, everybody, stand up. And I saw myself a couple times in this revival getting back into that because the expectation of people was high. And I fight that continually. Occasionally, I'll do it. I'm not saying it's a rule I never do. I do sometimes. But I am not going to get in the habit of it. You know, sometimes I sing a song, it crawls off the edge of the stage and dies. Let it die. I'm not going to save it. I'm not running a radio station. The Holy Spirit's not offended by dead air. Sometimes he likes it when we shut up so we can hear him. And it doesn't, mind, doesn't bother me to shut up sometimes and have that uneasy silence, you know, that before the track starts. It's okay because I'm not about performance. So I hope that answered that question. Yes. I just wanted to share one Sunday morning. I was a little frustrated and distracted. I didn't think the people were entering in like I wanted them to. Hello. <laughs> Anyways, but... um. So I was up there, and I was so distracted by that that God spoke to me clearly. He said, well, you're not doing it either. And I just kind of started crying because if you're so distracted by what the people aren't doing, well, what are you doing at that moment? You're not worshiping either. You're worried about them. So you're just as bad off. What you need to do is step in yourself, enter in. You're the worship leader. You're leading in worship, literally leading. And that's what you're there for. They need you. God has called you for a purpose because they need a leader. So what you need to do is worship by example. Don't worry about all the exhorting and cheerleading and stuff like that. You're called to be a worshiper. The only difference is you happen to be on stage and they're in the audience. God has put you there to lead by example. And if they want to step in with you, fine. But if not, don't miss out on your own experience with the Lord by being so distracted by what they're doing because that certainly won't get them into the presence of God. Um, someone asks a question, simple form, how do you 
a register with the Copyright Office, the Library of Congress, a song. Simple form, go down to the post office, have them order the form for you. It's an authorship kind of contract that you can get most at any governmental building. If they don't have them, they can get them for you. You fill out the information, you record your song with you singing it. You don't even have to have music with it, just you singing the lyrics, typewritten form of it, send it in, pay $20, and you're copywritten. But let me recommend if you've got a lot of songs, like hundreds, it'll save you tons of money if you'll do song books. Same price. It's $20 a song. It's $20 per work. And so what you do is you just take 100 of your songs, type them up, sing them off, make it songbook number one. Johnny Bohani's songbook number one. <laughs> And $20, and it's all, all of them are protected. And what you do is later on, if, if uh, uh, Ron Canoli calls you and says, you know, I was thinking about that song that you sent me, and I'd like to do it, then all you got to do is take that song from the songbook, separately copyright it again on its own, and it's protected. Okay? Is that easy? That's simple enough? Uh, one more, one or two more. It was a really good one I want to make sure I got because, oh, once somebody, somebody asked, how do you get rid of somebody on the praise team? Very, <laughs> very carefully. I've been trying to figure that out. There's two or three I'd like to get rid of. If y'all, I'm kidding. It's a joke. <laughs> no, uh, it, 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 it all depends on why. It all depends on why. I mean, are they, are they disrupting and being a jerk? Are they, do they have bad attitude? Uh, you know, there's several reasons, there's several ways to handle that, and it's just, I can't go into all that. If they're disrupting the whole rehearsal, or if you just don't like their voice, you know? It's hard to be honest, and I'm the king of, I'm the king of trying to coat it over with honey and then put the knife in. And sometimes they can tell you here, I try to coat it over with honey to the point that people don't get my point they don't get it and and i really at my base believe that honesty is probably the best thing to do but when you love people it's hard sometimes to say you know what your voice just doesn't fit and, and it hurts it hurts them and there's just no easy way that's like a root canal there's no easy way to do it and if it's just not working it's just not working but one of the things i prefer is trying to find them another area to sing in or another worship team to sing in so that so you're not you know because there are voices that just don't blend with each other. They just don't. Uh, does Mike Motley have CDs? I already dealt with that. Uh, how many new songs are too many when you're doing worship per week? Uh, if you're in an average church and a local church thing, uh, it probably is not good to introduce more than one to two a weekend because people don't latch on to them. In the revival, like to this week, I'm sure some of you have been in overload because you've heard so many new songs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was because we were recording. And also because this is a worship conference and we're hoping at MMI to become a resource, at Brownsville to become a resource for you. So we wanted you to hear the new worship songs so possibly you could use them. Because, you know, you don't want to come and hear me sing Spirit of the Sovereign Lord over and over and over again. So we tried to do it. I hope we did it right, but we tried to do it in a balance where... If you came to be a part of traditional Brownsville worship, you got a little of that. So you felt like, well, I got to be a part of that. And, 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 and then, but at the same time, we got to introduce you to some other people, which was our hope. Um, how do I guard against pride? Where'd she go? My wife. She don't believe a word I say. No. Um, you know what? I, can I just tell you, I don't, I don't mean this arrogantly or, or, or pridefully, but I, it's, not one of my, it's not one of my problems. It just, it's, I think it's because I have such a low self-esteem. I really do. I have a very low self-esteem. I don't think I'm really good at anything, honestly. So it's hard for me to get too full of pride because I know, I, I think and I understand, I know what real musicians... I know good musicians. You know, people come around. Somebody came to me this week and said, you shouldn't bash your singing so much. We love it. Well, you know, bless you. Thank you. I, I'm honored. 
but, but I know what real singers sound like, you know, and, and I know I'm not one. So pride, just not something I, we also didn't read all the articles that came in in the revival. We've read them since, but you know, the good ones and the bad ones, we just didn't, didn't always read on them and dwell on them. When people were raving and bragging and we were in our heyday in 97, 96, it was just like, it felt like it was happening to someone else. And uh, right now, the Lord knows my heart. If I had my druthers right now, I love this church, I love this revival, but I'd like to go find a church with about 50 people and just pastor it. Not because I'm angry or mad, but just because I don't need this. It's not who I am. And to me, it's very important that you don't become who you, what you do. You are a child of God and a worshiper of the Lord, and he receives worship from a humble heart from a broken spirit and baby you just ain't all that none of us are we preach a good sermon that's wonderful but I know that pride killed my predecessor Satan pride made a demon out of an angel and I refuse to go there it's just it's always God that does it and a lot of people think I'm arrogant I haven't figured that one out but well if they'll show me, I'll, I'll hear it. Uh, how important is attitude? Everything. Everything. We've got to stop. The reason I want to stop is I want the op opportunity to, you all have been quiet over there and you've been quiet back here. Is there something that, that you would like to share? I would appreciate you clarifying something. This is Larry Day. You've not met him. He, he, he obviously doesn't have a lot of pride either because you didn't have to see him. He's the, he's the general manager of MMI for me, so he's great. I would drown without him. I just wanted to clarify that question you just answered about the copyright question because it was the wrong answer, but, but it was... <laughs> but, no, see, it would have been the right answer if it had been a different question. <laughs> so, that was graceful, I thought. <laughs> Because um, I think the question was asked, how do you copyright something? You don't have to send away for anything. It is copy, copywritten as soon as it's in a fixed form. So if you're a songwriter and, or an author or whatever it is you do that's intellectual property, as soon as it's in a fixed form, which simply means it's on paper or it's on a recording, it is copywritten. Now, what you were talking about was registering a copyright, which is simply a little more uh, protection, you know, in case you were ending up in some kind of legal wrangle later. And then the form you're looking for is Form PA, um, and, it's, and it is uh, available on a website. Um, you can just go to the Copyright Office the website, download it, fill it out, mail it back. But, but just in case people thought they had to spend money copywriting something, they don't have to. There you have it. See, you see why he's around? I mean, this guy, thank you so much, Larry. Anything? Mike? Justin? Justin talks so much. Miss Judy? Steve? This is Steve Hill. The, what do you call yourself? I always never say you're a flute player because somebody said something that's supposed to be like, a flautist? That just sounds so... It sounds like Mexican food, and I just... I, I never played a flout before, but... So I call myself a flutist, or flute player, whatever you... A flute guy. <laughs> but... Um, I, there was a question about reverence and why it wasn't taught that I just noticed and I'd like to address that a little bit because I, I grew up in church in the assembly of God and I am um, so I've been around I, I might be older than I look I don't know I'm 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 one of the older guys on the team actually but um but um so I've seen a lot of things in my life and I I've been I took naps under the pew and and um, that's where I grew up I was in church the first week I was born I was my mom brought me the next, I was born on Monday, I was in church on Sunday. So, um, God's good, and, I, and I've loved it, and I've seen so many things, but, 
but reverence for God's house. I was looking that up in the dictionary because, because some people misunderstand what reverence is. Come on. Mm -hmm. They think reverence may be sitting quiet and, um, and um, not making a commotion. But, but what the word actually means, according to Webster, which he's the authority on that, he says that it means um, um, affection and um, su submission and, um, and respect and, and fear. And I, I feel like we've got a lot of respect and fear in this place. I know I do. When I first stepped on this platform, I, I felt so out of place and so um, just trembling inside because, because I know of God's presence and what he's done in this place and how he's moved here and, and wondered what I was doing here. But that, that brings a respect and, a, and an honor on, on our part towards God. And, um, and I think what we were doing last night honored God with the, I know it brought fear in me just to feel his presence come in here in such a powerful way. And, and when David danced before the Lord with all his might, that was honoring God and that was being submitted to God also. Because, because when we sit still, when God's saying for us to rejoice and when, when God's saying for us to shout, which he does in his word, he says that several places, and when he says to dance with all your might, which he says that, we're, we're being unsubmissive when we don't. And so, so when we, we teach reverence for God's house by being obedient to him and what he's saying for us to do and when he's saying for us to do it and not, and not being out of place because there's a time to be quiet and there's a time to rejoice. So it's a time and place for everything. See, the people working with me are smarter than I am, I'm telling you. I'm blessed. Thank you, Steve. Blessings. Anybody? I mean, this is your chance. Don't walk out of here and go, hey, didn't add me, Quagan. Okay. have felt real impressed this conference and I've talked to some of the people on the worship team and have just been stirred in my heart that God has had a mission for us this conference the people in this church and it is time that the church of God learns to hear the voice of God and to know that you are in a war. This is a war. You are fighting for your families, for your church, for your cities, for your nation. You're in a war. We all have a place in this war. Every person has a place, a place to fight in the battle for God. And we have to learn to put away the things that so easily beset us, the pettiness, the silliness. There's no room for pride or ego or arrogance in the army of God and in the kingdom of God. It is time to put our, our hearts and our focus on God and the task at hand that he has for us to do. Every single person in this place has a job, has a task from God. And he will tell you if you hear him. And Job, I believe it's 33, 14, says that God is speaking continually, but man is not able to perceive it. Ask him to teach you to hear his voice, to know what he would have for you to do, where he wants you to walk and what he has, what it is. The Bible says that the steps of the righteous are ordered by God. The steps are already there. We have to learn what they are, to learn to walk in those steps. Well. And to, 
top that off. Don't, don't place your spiritual significance on the external things. Your spiritual significance is with God. It's not in what somebody else sees. You know, it's, it's you and God. That's where you get your, you know, your, your flow. If you're worrying about what somebody else thinks of you spiritually, then you're looking at the wrong place. And you can't do that in worship setting. It won't work. I want to thank Lyndall and Lila and Jesse, Mike, Judy, Brenda, just everybody that uh, I've been blessed, man. I have been blessed. I've been stirred. I've been changed. And I, I thank you and I appreciate that so much. Yesterday, uh, when we opened up in worship, I shared a verse, and I just want to leave you with that. Psalms 40, verse 3. He hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto God. Many shall see it and fear and put their trust in the Lord. This Sunday, we will be returning to our places of worship. And we're going to want it to look like it looked last night. How many, how many can say also it's not going to look like what it did last night? Okay. And, and that can be really difficult. The Lord has changed us. We've been in, a, in such an environment of worship and the presence of Almighty God. And I would encourage each one here. First of all, we so appreciate you coming from literally all over the world just to be here. It shows that you hunger after God. It shows that you want to learn. It shows that you want to be a vessel. It shows that you want to be used of God to lead others into the presence of the Lord, whether it be through intercession or, or worship. And I would encourage you, when you go back to your places of worship this Sunday, don't worry about making changes. That's right. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about having to, to, to convince people what needs to change? That's, that's, that's not where it's at. He has put a new song in your mouth. He's put something new in your mouth. Now, you don't even have to share it. People will see it, and they're going to fear and trust in the Lord. Paul and Silas, they're in prison. Why are they in prison? Because they were sharing Jesus. What did they do? Did they sit there in that smelly, dark dungeon Silas, it was your fault. Why'd you have to mention, no, no, Paul, it was your fault. You know, what did I tell you about preaching? You know, it wasn't like, if it was me, I'd be singing the Paul and Silas blues, you know? Come on. But what did they do? At midnight, they began to sing praises to God. You know, if you, if you research that out there, singing praises to God, it wasn't just one of these uh, minor tunes. You know what I'm saying? It was a celebration. In the worst of circumstances, they celebrated unto God. What happened? God performs a miracle, uh, uh, opens a jail. The jailer takes note and looks at them and says, what do I have to do to be saved? What am I saying here this morning? I'm saying, you go back, be passionate after God, let people see your life. You don't have to do a thing. Let God do it. And some of us are going back. Some of us are going back to dungeon situations. Some of us are going back. You know, I, I've come to realize life is just one big transition. It is just one big transition. I'm 43 years old. I'm still saying, when I grow up, I want to. You know, I mean, that's just the way it is. It's, it's one change after the other. And let me encourage you, no matter how difficult the circumstances are that you're returning to, don't worry about changing through the spoken word. Allow Jesus to change as you're passionate for him. Many shall see it, and they will fear and put their trust in the Lord.
I won't take up too much time because I could go on and on about this, but I feel that I should honor Lyndall this morning. And I do this humbly because you have no idea just the influence that he's had on my life. Um, there's a lot of prophetic significance I've never even shared with him. And when God called me to lead worship, I had no clue what I was doing, and I still don't have the time. But um, God brought me into a whole new place, and a lot of it began right here up on this balcony. And um, I remember one night, um, see, the Lord brought me from being a performer to a worshiper, and I'd never done that, and it was so freeing for me. And I remember one of the last visits before I really got free to worship that I came to Brownsville. Um, I was so hungry, and one thing I wanted to share earlier about manifestation is, you know, when, when somebody's hungry, they don't care what the food looks like. They're just starving for something real and something fresh. And I remember walking out in this hall and seeing people, you know, they're, oh, this water's good, isn't it? You know, they're just shaking about anything, and I was like, well, that's different. But I was so hungry, and I didn't care. I didn't care, you know? And you know, I'd never done any of that stuff, but you get to a point where you just want to worship God and you don't care what it's like. And, but I was up in that pew and you were singing How Priceless. I'd never even heard the song. I was just getting introduced to Vineyard. I still listen to Spirit of the Sovereign Lord CD because I was over there in that floor and that's the first, that's the CD that was on. And I'm just like, Ugh. but I just want to give honor to him because Amen. that night... God changed me. I wept for probably 20 to 30 minutes. Didn't know what was happening. I was sitting by my cousins. I was just new to all this. And when I got home, I was dancing. I was jumping. I was laughing. I wasn't frowning anymore and, and miserable in church. I was free to worship my God, and I've never been the same. But there's a lot of prophetic significance. I didn't have a mentor. I've, I've still not had a direct mentor over me to lead worship. I've had to learn through the Holy Spirit and from videos and from um, watching worship services and just hearing his heart coming to conference, whatever I could get. Um, the Lord placed him in my life from afar. He's mentored me without even knowing it, really. Not to say I'm like him in how I do things, but just to have a spiritual influence. And um, one more thing, this is just one of many, many, many things that God has done. Um, I had a dream about three years ago, and this was before a lot of this stuff happened, where I was able to even sing here or anything like that, which I never dreamed any of that would happen. But um, I, was, I was in a dream, and Linda was up leading worship, and he had, this, he had a mic just like this, and he was walking around, and he wasn't at the keyboard. He was kind of preaching and just exhorting. And um, I was about right here in some service somewhere, just singing in the spirit, just singing in tongues, just caught up in the worship of the Lord. And, um, and he caught me up and he said, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. And he said, it's your turn, something like that. It's been a while, but, but he, said, he gave me the mic. And I remember another part of the dream, somebody brought me water and they were washing me with the word of God and just preparing me. And that's before a lot of stuff happened. And literally, I think it was that year, it wasn't very far after that, I was in a service at Brownsville about right here somewhere, just singing, just worshiping God. And he was like, Jesse, come here. And that's happened just a few times where he would just call me out of, out of worship to sing before the Lord. And just, just the chances he's given me. And just I just want to honor you for opening up your door to, to young writers and young worshipers because that's what it's about. You know? And, um, but he's influenced so many people. And I just, today, when I was sitting here, I just saw Lendl before the throne of God. And there were so many people that just were honoring him. And I feel like he's even going to be able to lead in heaven some. I don't know. Maybe we'll all just do it together. But, but I just want to, you have no idea. And I just want to thank him. And I, I, I don't want to leave here unappreciative. And I just want to humbly say thank you very much for allowing Mike and I and whoever you open up to, to be able to lead worship and just learn and train under you. You know, David's dead. So all we can do is read about him. We need somebody else to be right here with us, you know. So I just want to say thank you. Can we honor him this morning? I love you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I want to say to you, wherever you are, you may be in a little bitty town. 
You may be in an, a little bitty place and not feel like you have very much. You may come to meetings like this and think, I'm just the smallest one here. I, I can't even play well or I don't, I could never intercede like Lila or teach like Lila or lead worship like Jesse or but you know what? I was a little boy in a little town with not much going on. And the Lord brought me this way. He is so good. Don't quit. Don't you stop. People will hurt you. They don't mean to, but they will. They'll hurt you. They'll discourage you. Your own mind will try to talk you out of what you're supposed to do. But don't quit. It's not the one that runs the fastest. It's the one that finishes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord's in here, isn't he? learned that all it takes is a heart and the Lord told me just to go up there and burn I've done that and God is changing our church so all of you I thank you please be encouraged we're, we're out there praying for you guys with what uh, we know life is full of hard times but we're praying for you and we just encourage you we say thank you we love you and uh, you've been a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, while you're standing, uh, can we just all stand up here and maybe everybody come forward and let's stand out here and maybe just bless these folks before they leave. I want to bless you. Thank you, Jesse. Those words are... Mike and I had one of those kind of talks a month or so ago and he just... These guys, you encourage me because you just... Sometimes you do it and do it and do it and you don't know if you're doing any good. <laughs> And everybody thinks it's obvious to you, but it's, it's good to hear. They're... Yes, ma'am. It's, it's really hard, I know, for a lot of people to get up in front of a crowd and say something. And God has told me to stand up and say this. And he said he will give me the words. And I don't know what they are, but I want to tell all of you before I came here, I've been here many times, but before this time, I was so full of me. And that song keeps coming to me. And I don't even know where I've heard it. Maybe I heard it here. It's not about me. It's all about you. And I was all about me. It was all about me. But I wanted a life-changing experience. And I guess I wanted another one than when I've been here before. But I said, I've got to have be changed before I go back because the Lord showed me in a vision that I was ice skating and that's something he gives me a lot of times because it's so beautiful, these skaters, and it's in a worship style. And he showed me that 
I cut the ice and he said, you will make a difference, but it wouldn't be a difference if it wasn't for him, if it was for me, but I'm going back and I'm going to make a difference for God. And it's because of all of your obedience and it's because of your prayers. And I just praise God for each and every one of you who've been obedient because you've sacrificed your family time. You've sacrificed your own personal conveniences. And that's not always easy. I don't know if I could have done it or would have wanted to. And I just praise God. And I believe that I speak for a lot of others here. Thank you all so much. When I go home, it's going to be about him. Thank you. Right there. Right, right, right there is why we do this. Because do you see this? You're going to go home and you're going to affect other people. Because you know what happened to you? It was nothing we did, but you got it. You see, you got it. And it's our most, our biggest concern is that people come here and they don't get it. They walk away and they don't get it. And you got it. And see, this is what God has called us to do. Whatever the style, he's called us to spread this this way of worshiping to people, not stylistically, but from the heart. Uh, can, we'll take one more. Bill, there's a lady right over here. Hold it. The mic is coming to you so everyone can hear you. She's right there. It's that beautiful lady with that beautiful white hair. Mine won't be pretty like that when it turns white. I came here 96 and spent a week. And came to intercession, and I am an intercessor. And I, we, I went back home and the pastor asked me to, to start intercession. And I want you to know that, that we took the syllabus and we went with the first thing that, that she had done. And God had so blessed intercession. I have gone other places and helped other churches start intercession. And so I am the leader in my church, over 2,500 people. And I just want you to know that I want these people that are intercessors, they are setting a goal for us and they're showing us and I want every intercessor to cry out to God to learn travail because that's where it's birthed and it's going to take the birthing to bring forth what God wants in these last days praise God for Lila to you we love you you want to can we wow Can we just say this? Your kind words mean so much to us, and I know that some of you may have other things in your heart to say. I don't want to hold everybody, but I want to do. I do want to say that there's some things we didn't get to on here. Uh, we have a website, uh, mmi-inc.com, and uh, we've got a couple people on this worship team, i.e., Lori and uh, Becky. Do you get up on the website? Are you the website guru? Is it? It's Lori and Carol, isn't it? These two ladies, I didn't know if you did it too, I knew they did. They are like the gurus of the website and they're up there constantly and I thank y'all for doing that because it's a forum where you can post a question and if for some reason we didn't get to your question, Carol sometimes will, will or Lori will email me and go, hey, we got a question, what, what, how do you think we're gonna deal with this one? And, and we'll get that question answered even if we didn't get it today on here. Uh, just just get on the website mmi-inc.com and uh, hopefully Mike I haven't asked you to do this but Mike and some of the guys and Jesse could come up and visit maybe we could schedule times where we could just have more of this kind of interaction you know via, via internet it's a nice tool isn't it but what we'd like to do right now is thank you again for your kind words they're encouraging to us it helps us so much and, and your faces, just, just your faces at the end of this week to see him glowing with the presence of the Lord and to know that God has done something. It just thrills us. It makes, I don't know about y'all how you feel, but I can speak for myself, feel like well, we're, we're a little tired in body, but it was worth all of it because you know what? It's, we, can we say this too? We needed this conference more than you did. And, and, and Lori and I said last night, you know, we really didn't need another conference. We don't, we're, we're, we don't want to do any more conferences. But I had a feeling that God wanted to do something in us this week. And I knew the devil would fight it. And he did. 
But man, did God do something in me personally. I, I feel like that old song out of the Church of God read back hymn. No, I feel like traveling on. I feel like I can make I can make it another week. I feel like, you know, will you pray for us and continue to pray for us because we still have all kinds of transition we're in the middle of. And, uh, you know, we, we with Benny and Hazel down for a little while, that's a big hole to fill. We miss them so much. And, you know, it's just, just lots of things transitioning and moving around. And we're just all going, oh, God, just help us. And you know what? He's helping us. And, and pray for the Lord's direction for Benny and Hazel. For, for different ones that, that, that are moving in different areas, pray for them and bless them because they need that blessing because our whole idea, we knew everybody wouldn't hang around here when they came. We're used to people leaving and, and we're looking for more people to leave. Not because we want them to, but we, I, I, Jesse, just when you said that, I see a day when we will have people all over the nations not just from this stream, but, it's, but for us from this stream that have this anointing, this anointing, that anointing, that anointing, that they're just out there just doing it. And that's what we want to see. But we want to bless you to go home. And uh, we're just going to, if you're cool with this, just lift your, after last night anything goes, lift your hand, right hand. And we just stretch our hands to you and we bless you. We bless your ministry, your prayer ministry, your music ministry, your preaching ministry, teaching, your apostolic or prophetic ministry. We bless it. We send the blessing of this house with you where you're going, wherever it is. We send the passion from this house with you. We send the evangelism from this house to dwell in you and in your house. We bless your church, your pastor, your ministries. We bless your family. We bless you that any broken relationships will be mended by the Holy Spirit. We bless that any attack of finances against you will stop in the name of the Lord. We bless you that you will be given more and be prospered more so that you can catapult and push the ministry into the uttermost parts of the earth. We bless you with songs. We bless you with the sound of heaven. We bless you with freedom and relationships. We bless you with favor that everywhere your footsteps the Lord gives you. We bless you that everywhere your prayer takes you, the Lord gives it to you as your inheritance. We bless you that the attacks on your mind will cease and that every enemy will flee from you. That the Lord will cause his favor to shine upon you and his face and countenance to be upon you. We bless you with every spiritual gift, with every spiritual blessing. And that no, you won't look back and go, oh, I wish we could be like Brownsville. But rather, we bless you that God will do his thing right where you are. And that in years and times and not many days to come, we'll go, wow. We want to go get the blessing of the house in Georgia. We want to get the blessing of the house in Israel. We want to go get the blessing of what God's doing here or there. That from your heart and from your experience, people will come and watch you burn. And that God will stir a fire in your city that will be noised abroad. That people will come from counties and towns to see what God has done in your life and in your place of worship. We bless you with rest. We bless you that the spirit of confusion would be from you. We bless you that the spirit of busyness would fade from you and that you would have peace. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we bless you. We bless you. And let's all say amen to seal it. So be it and amen. God bless you. Thank you.